Uh, what I want to say is that uh, uh, I think that what I call Christian atheism is still the ethical stance which fits today's predicament. Okay. Uh, let me begin with a simple observation. Those who follow obscure spiritual cosmological speculations have for sure heard of one of the most popular topics in this domain. You know all these mythical stories that when three planets, usually Earth, Moon and the Sun, find themselves among, along the same axis, then some big cataclysmic event takes place the whole order of the universe is momentarily thrown out of joint and the universe has to find a new balance. You remember that it wasn't taken seriously, but the panic of 2012, where idea is to some Maya, old Maya predictions, precisely because I think Earth, Moon and Sun were in the same line, it's not good. And I think that politically something like this holds for this year, 2017, which is a triple anniversary. In 2017, we do not celebrate only the centenary of the October Revolution, 1917, but also the 150th anniversary of the first edition of Marxist Capital, 1867, and maybe the most tragic event, the 50th anniversary of the so-called Shanghai Commune, when in the climactic moment of the Chinese Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, it's a wonderful moment, maybe the crucial moment of 20th century communism, residents of Shanghai, workers and students, decided to take literally Mao's call you know when Mao said, uh, attack the headquarters. We, you don't need neither the party nor the army. People should take over. Well, they took this literally and simply overthrew offices, destroyed of local communist party, ignored the army and took over. And that was the crucial point because then Mao had to send the army. And it's an extremely tragic event because... This was then, people don't know this, the biggest battle of the Cultural Revolution. Forget about, okay, they were tragic, all those scenes, you know, red guardists uh, pulling their beard, uh, terrorizing professors, intellectuals, all that. No, it was the battle for Shanghai when the army turned on the very revolutionaries. And one doesn't know how many the idea is that it goes into tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dead people. But I, I think this event is fascinating, fascinating because it's, I don't like this big question, was Mao sincere or not? At a certain level, he was not. It's clearly that he triggered the Cultural Revolution to regain his full power in the army, sorry, in the state. But it doesn't matter if Mao was manipulating. Things ran out of control. Ordinary workers took it seriously. Let's have directly the rule of the commune. We don't need the party, we don't need the army and so on. And it went too far. So I think these three events mark the three stages of the communist movement. First, Capital by Marx outlined the theoretical foundations of the communist revolution. Then, the October Revolution was the first successful attempt to overthrow bourgeois state and build a new social economic order. And then the Shanghai Commune stands for the most radical attempt to immediately realize the most daring aspect of the communist vision the abolishment of state power and the imposition of direct people's power organized as a network of local communes. It didn't work, and of course I will not answer the question today, namely the big question, what went wrong? I think, that's my hypothesis, what went wrong with this cycle, perhaps, 
the answer is to be sought. And people don't talk about it, but for me at least, as a Christian atheist, it's the key date. Don't you know that today we have another, we have four planets in a line, another mega anniversary. 2017 is the 500 years anniversary of 1517, when Martin Luther put on that door the 95 Theses, Protestantism. And I still think that the Protestantism is the key, the greatest religious event that you can imagine. Why? Let me begin in a very simplified way, but I'm not totally bluffing, because I presented a version of this text in a theological, at a theological colloquium in Cambridge, and it went well, what can I say? So I'm not totally <laughs> bluffing. I'm not totally bluffing. Let me begin by this triad of orthodoxy, Catholicism, and Protestantism. The way I see it, maybe I'm wrong, central to the orthodox tradition is the notion of theosis, of man becoming like God. Or to quote Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, quote, she, Christ, or God, was incarnate so that we might be made God. End of quote. What should otherwise seem absurd that fallen sinful men may become holy as God is holy has been made possible through Jesus Christ who is God incarnate. And then uh, Saint Maximus the Confessor wrote in the same vein, again a quote, a sure warrant, warrant for looking with hope to deification of human nature is provided by the incarnation of God, which makes man God to the same degree as God himself became man. Let us become the image of the one whole God, bearing nothing earthly in ourselves, so that we may consort with God and become gods, receiving from God our existence as gods. End of quote. This orthodox formula, God became man so that man uh, becomes God, is, I think, what Protestantism radically Rejects The deepest insight of Protestantism, although it's implicit already in the Bible, is that, to put it very simply, God become man and that's it. Nothing more. Everything already happens in the incarnation. What needs to be added is just a shift of perspective. I think that in authentic Christian vision, there is no resurrection to follow. Holy Ghost already is resurrection. Resurrection happens in the Christian community. God dies and he remains dead. We are condemned to freedom. Holy community is not, there is, I read here Christianity in a radically atheist way. Holy Ghost is not some kind of a synthesis. God, man, and then they are brought together. No. With crucifixion, precisely that type of God, you know, this primitive idea up there, then is a great old guy with a long beard who takes care of us, so don't worry too much, ultimately we are taken care of. That's what Hegel, my favorite, puts it nicely. He says, what dies on the cross is not an earthly representative of God. It's God himself, that God of beyond. So what remains? We, in our freedom. And that would be the properly Christian trick. Uh, I say God gave us all freedom and so on. He said, but he didn't. God abandoned. He just creates us and let us alone. God abandoned us. I say, but that's another name for freedom. You should just shift the perspective. Or to put it in another way, and I'm here, I'm basing my reading on some very good theologists from my beloved Chesterton onwards. Uh, uh, in other religions, to simplify it very much, you have God, man. We have fallen from God, so the idea is let's climb back through some stupid spiritual exercises, whatever you want. Like, let's, become, let's get rid of our sinful nature, let's go back to God. The Christian solution is a totally different one. 
It is this one. Okay, let's say you, an ordinary believer, find yourself totally abandoned by God. So what's the way out of it? Not, okay, let me do some good works or self-punishment to become clean. No, it's that uh, at that point, when I'm totally abandoned by God, I identify with Christ who finds himself in exactly the same position with the famous uh, 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 Father, Father, have you forsaken me? So that it's a wonderful insight that uh, uh, you should see in a very Hegelian way how our separation, we overcome our separation from God, not by rejoining God, but by realizing that this separation is separation also of God from himself. That at that point, we are divine. Because, again, the ultimate moment of divinity is that moment of, as Gilbert Keith Chesterton put it, the moment when God himself becomes an atheist. You know, because remember, on the cross, when Christ says, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, gavadar, he for a brief moment becomes a non-believer. Uh, which is a crazy moment. You find this in no other religion. In other religions, you do find men who abandon God. Where do you find God who abandons himself? And again, the Christian solution is not, you suffer, you are low, but don't worry. There are good news. No, there are no good news. Good news are only a different shift of perspective on the bad news. We remain abandoned by God. God will not come to save us, as even conservative theologists who are not stupid knew, like Paul Claudel, my favorite French conservative Catholic. He says very nicely that the, the ultimate secret of Christianity is not trust God. Things may look bad, but God will help you. No, it's the opposite. God needs our help. We, only we can save God. In other words, uh, the divine... And some theosophic speculation, I'm not going to it, we don't have time to lose here, uh, develop this in a wonderful way where they claim that the secret of, re -incar of incarnation is not that God did something heroic to redeem us. God, God without incarnation is not fully God. God incarnates himself in man to become fully God. That's the solution of one of my favorite, apart from Hegel, German idealist Schelling, who developed in his Heidegger claim you know, that these two texts, especially Freiheitsschrift, Schelling's uh, uh, text on the essence of human freedom, and later Weltalter fragments on the ages of the world, he developed this how God produced Logos, gave birth to Logos' son, uh, Schelling literally said this, to save himself of his own, from his own madness. It was, if I may be cynical, a kind of, you know, psychiatrists say, if you are caught in psychosis, you need creative therapy, you know, through work. Well, that's what God did. And uh, some very, if you think I'm bluffing, some very intelligent Protestant theologists came to the same conclusion. Like a Norwegian friend of mine, gave me a reference and he translated some parts to me because it's a, not a well-known book, famous only in Norway. The guy's uh, name is Peter Wessel Zapfe, a book on Protestantism God. It's a reading of Book of Job. And you know what's his reading? What does Job discover when he encounters God when he realizes that God is doing very strange things, punishing him for nothing, and so on. Here is a quote from Zapfe. Job finds himself confronted with the world ruler, God, of grotesque primitiveness, a cosmic cave dweller, a braggart and blusterer, almost agreeable in his total ignorance of spiritual culture. What is new for Job is not God's greatness in quantifiable terms. That we knew fully in advance. What is new is God's qualitative baseness. And I think this is masked insight also of the big Protestant topic of predestination. 
You mean, God was simply playing a brutal game with us. He didn't care. God decided in advance, you are redeemed, you are lost. Totally irrespective of what we are doing. And I think this is the right line. I think that as intelligent Protestants saw it, this Catholic way of linking our salvation to our good works introduces immediately an element of handling, of of financial transaction. I see that child drowning, should I do it or not? Well, I may gain salvation, so fuck it, why not do it, you know? It makes our good deeds part of an almost, I would say, financial investment into the future. No? But as Luther put, put it very intelligently, if there is predestination, then the solution is pure goodness. Because you see a child drowning, sorry for this pathetic example, and you know very well that it will not help your salvation in any way if you help the child or not. So it's only goodness that uh, it's only goodness that makes you that uh, that makes you do it. Uh, so uh, uh, sorry, we are here. Yes. So uh, let's go on here. What uh, in this position where the solution is not some kind of a reunification of God with man, we overcome our alienation of God through a simple realization that God is already alienated from himself, self-abandoned. I like to apply here to divinity Hegel's wonderful reading of ancient Greek statues which are impenetrable for us, like what does the Sphinx mean? And you know what's Hegel's formula? The secrets of ancient Greeks, secrets for us, were already secrets for ancient Greeks themselves. And Hegel's theology is precisely this one, that the, the secrets of divinity are secrets for, for also for divinity itself. This is the old mystical topic. Hegel goes there into that line. You find it in Meister Eckhart and all other guys, that to bring history into God himself. What happens on our earth, our theological activity, decides the fate of God himself, in a way. It's the other way around. It's not that God decides. No, we, in our struggles, we fight for the fate of God himself. So, how to bring this and now it comes, maybe it will be a little bit difficult, the proper theological point. I think I improvised a little bit already in my classes about this. I th does this mean that Protestantism simply abolishes our freedom? Everyone who knows Luther, and I don't have the time to go into it, but I have it written, a detailed analysis of the tension between Martin Luther and, of course, Thomas Mincher the great theologist of the German peasant revolt. Maybe this will surprise you, but I'm almost more on the early Luther's side. He was right, Muncher, in criticizing Luther for his conformism, taking the side of the masters and so on. But Muncher, I think, comes all too close then to this perverse instrumental position which comes close to totalitarianism. Because Luther was right, and this was his greatest theological insight, to insist on divine impenetrability, which written materials way doesn't mean God knows what he is doing, we just cannot penetrate it. It means that quote from Zappe, God is crazy, doesn't know it. So uh, uh, Luther warned against Precisely what we call today fundamentalism. Any position of an agent, historical, who... My God, what is happening here? I'm getting superstitious. <laughs> yes, there it was one, at least they are not black cats, and we will survive there. Uh, but it's the Maoist movement. One divides into two, no? Yes, they were one. Okay, sorry, let's go on. That... Uh, that uh, Luther comes too close to this, seeing his political movement as direct instrument of the divine will. 
And this is what Luther is right to prohibit. She insists on this radical impenetrability. There is predestination, but we never know what is predestination. Like, our lives are decided in advance, but we cannot ever know it. So it's absolutely prohibited to claim I am an instrument of the divine will, like the Stalinist communists in a different way. Historical necessity of progress towards communism runs through me. No, we cannot do it. And I think this is authentic freedom. This idea of my life is predestined, but I don't know what it is, so this terrible struggle to make the right decision. This, because, you know, here common sense doesn't work. Because common sense would tell us, why do you worry? If there is predestination, sit down and masturbate and watch hardcore movies, it doesn't matter. No, the idea is that that's the, this also, that it doesn't work, explains, we all know it, I'm even repeating myself, I think years ago I was already selling this here, I'm sorry, because this also explains this paradox of predestination and freedom, explains the greatest uh, mystery of this old uh, Max Weber's thesis, why is Protestantism, as a religion which is based on predestination, why Protestantism became the religious background, at least originally, of capitalism, which is precisely the most active social system, a system where you are solicited to be active like crazy all the time. Again, wouldn't it be logical to claim, if it's predestined, fuck off, I lay down, awaken me when God comes, but <laughs> leave me alone. No, uh, uh, Weber saw this clearly and Luther, that precisely because you don't know it, knowing that your fate is decided but not knowing what your fate is, pushes you to incessant activity. And I think that this decision, this difficult decision to discover if there is predestination, fate, necessity, what is that fate? is much closer to authentic freedom than, I'm using now a metaphor that I already used, I'm sorry for my students in my class, than this simple freedom of, I go to a patisserie, they have strawberry cake, chocolate cake, vanilla cake, or which one I will choose, you know, this simple freedom of choice. No, true freedom is this one, and even, now you will say, I'm crazy, but let me give you an example to repeat it that I already give in my class. Think about love the choice of object in love. It must be free. If not, it's not love, of course, no? But it never happens to you, admit it, as a free choice. If you say, oh, now I will fall in love into that lady or man, it's fake. It is a free decision, but as Schelling would have put it, a transcendental, atemporal free decision, which you experience precisely as its opposite, as your fate. You experience love as, my God, I cannot escape it, I'm caught into it. And that's true freedom. That's the radical freedom. Now you will say, this is sentimental speculation. No, I'll use another example from my class. Isn't it exactly the same with a tough political decision? Not these simple decisions, vote for Macron, vote for Le Pen, which, tough, I don't care. Uh, but... Let's make a pathetic example. There is war, my country is attacked, and I have to decide, will I risk my life, do it or not? This is a free decision by me. But if you take the difficult decision that you will fight, you don't experience it as a choice. You experience it, I would love not to do it, but it's my duty, I cannot not do it. I have to do it. You know, and I think this provides... This wonderful dialectic described, as far as I know, by philosophy uh, only nicely, clearly, only by Hegel, how uh, predestination is much more paradoxical if we read Protestantism in a materialist way than uh, the simple notion there is predestination, everything is decided. No, it means we have a fate, but we retroactively create this fate. Like, I freely decide something, and once I decide it, 
it retroactively becomes necessary. If I do the right thing, I experienced it, my God. I couldn't do it otherwise. I had to do it. That's freedom. So that's my first point about Protestantism, which means that not only you are free, but you are even more free than you thought. You are even responsible for your faith, for your necessity. And again, as I already uh, explained in my uh, in, in in my uh, uh, in my uh, classes, uh, uh, here psychoanalysis rejoins Protestantism because in psychoanalysis the obvious result is something like predestination. You know, like I think I'm a free being, but no, everything is predetermined through my past traumas, through whatever you know. So I discovered that I'm not free, and this was the fashionable lesson half a century ago with that fashion of structuralism in France, this is how psychoanalysis was read, structural psychoanalysis. You think you are a free subject? No. You are just a puppet, the big other, the symbolic order runs the game and so on. But no, Lacan follows here Freud. Yes, you are overdetermined, but you cannot use this overdetermination or psychic necessity which makes you what you are, you cannot use it as an excuse, you know, like to be vulgar, I'm sorry. I rape a child and then I say to the judges, sorry guys, what can I do? I was overdetermined by my unconscious complex. No, you are predestined by fate, but you are responsible even for that. You are much more radically uh, responsible. And I can't go into it now, I already did it in my class to develop how the same goes uh, also for, that's why it's a great thing, Kantian ethics. When Kant says, do Kant, then do Zolst. You can do it because you must do it. Like, no excuse to not do your duty. If it's your duty, you have to do it. But Kant, this is not so often noticed, goes even a step further. He also implies that even doing your duty cannot be an excuse for doing your duty. Like, Chris, I hate you, let me do Like, I have to do something, it's my duty which will hurt you. I don't have the right to tell you, sorry guy, but it's my duty. No, I don't have the right to externalize it. I'm not responsible only to do my duty. I have to fully subjectively assume also my duty in the sense of what is my duty. This is why, incidentally, I mentioned this briefly in my class, and now I will stop with plagiarizing myself. Don't worry, I will not <laughs> repeat my class. This is why I think that although I admire her, at some point in her otherwise wonderful uh, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, if I remember it correctly, Hannah Arendt was wrong. When she took seriously Eichmann's statement that he was just a good Kantian. He did his duty for him. Duty was embodied in Führer's orders. So, sorry, I was doing my duty. No, Kant, uh, sorry, not Kant, uh, 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 Eichmann did precisely the wrong thing. He was not a Kantian because he did something that Kant strictly prohibits. He used duty as an excuse. Sorry, I helped killing millions of Jews. What can I do? That's my duty. No, you cannot refer to your duty as some objective determination that you have just to follow. You are radically responsible for your, for your duty. Now I will complicate things. Now the end of self-plagiarizing. You will get some new stuff. This solution, this dialectical interconnection of necessity and freedom, where yes, there is necessity, but this necessity is in a deeper sense contingent. Like, you do something in a contingent way, once you do it, it retroactively becomes your fate. This solution works only on one condition. The subject, believer, agent, is absolutely constrained by the horizon of his, her, its finite subjectivity. What Protestantism prohibits is the very thought that a as a believer, I can, as it were, took a position outside, above myself, and look upon myself as a small particle in the vast reality. 
here, since I already mentioned Mao Zedong, I would like to criticize him a little bit at the philosophical level, and incidentally, because of some of my lines like this, Alain Badiou is even now mad at me, <laughs> you know. Uh, Mao Zedong, I think, was wrong when he deployed his Olympic vision, reducing human experience to a tiny, unimportant cosmic detail. You know, in his famous statement where he say we don't fear atomic war and so on, okay, with that I in principle agree. But Mao went on and said this, a quote from Mao Zedong, the United States cannot annihilate the Chinese nation with its small stack of atom bombs. Even if the US atom bombs were so powerful that when dropped on China, they would make a hole right through the earth or even blew the earth up, that would hardly mean anything to the universe as a whole, though it might be a major event for the solar system, and so on. You know, it's kind of a weird excuse. Okay, Americans can destroy us, but what does it mean from the standpoint of the universe or whatever? Uh, I think that uh, uh, this argument, Mao's, only works if, in a pseudo-Kantian way, we presuppose like some, like, the problem is, where is Mao speaking from? From what subjective position when he states this? He acts as if he speaks from a totally external, purely divine position, where you see objectively reality with inhuman eyes, and then you can say, okay, our Earth is blown apart, fuck it, a tiny blimp in some small planet, who cares? Uh, but uh, here, I don't have time to develop it, but this is a beautiful theological topic. Uh, intelligent Protestantism have a wonderful vision where it's again that link between contingency and necessity. On the one hand, yes, we are a tiny piece of shit in a vast universe. Uh, Protestantism is not uh, ethnocentric, which is why Protestantism, insofar as it stands for modernity, was precisely the religious background of modern science, which precisely introduced the objective view of reality. You know that before Protestantism, the medieval world was Earth in the center, although we humans were not the center of the universe, it was uh, God, but nonetheless, uh, we were the highest point of the created universe, everything turned around us, and so on and so on. So, uh, uh, what Protestantism unites, I don't have time to develop it now, just to give an idea, is, I think, something wonderful. It's, at the same time, this extremely brutal view. From an inhuman gaze, we are nothing. A tiny species on Earth, it doesn't matter. But nonetheless, since we cannot ever really assume that view, external view, in our ethical practice, we have to act as if whenever, and Kant, Kant puts it this very nicely, although objective science is telling us that, fuck it, we are again one tiny piece of dust in the universe, nonetheless, in a big ethical struggle, it's not just our fate that is decided, it, as it were, can't put it so nicely, the entire universe was created as a background for that struggle of ours. You know, I love this unity of extreme ethnocentrism. The world was created so that we can fight this battle. And this radical, radically external view. Because uh, this is, in a way, when you witness a big change, revolution, or what? Now you can ask me a simple question. Why do I call this Christian atheism? Why don't I simply say it's a materialist ethics? Like this, pure goodness, no guarantee. Ah, here, of course I am a materialist. No misunderstanding here. But I, uh, uh, my good friend, I really like him. Okay, not good friend, I boast, I exaggerate. I met him two times. We went along really well. You know, Rowan Williams, the leftist ex-archbishop of Canterbury, in his book on Dostoevsky, 
I don't like Dostoevsky, but I like his book, William, this of Dostoevsky. He, among other things, I cannot restrain from briefly describing this to you, he provides the best reading that I can imagine of Dostoevsky's idiot. You know, the usual reading of idiot is he is too divine for this world, a saint. For Rowan Williams, it's a wonderful reading. And it's so deeply true if you know the story of Dostoevsky's idiot. He is not pure evil, idiot, Prince Mishkin, but something much more refined. There are people, and I met them, they really exist, who are really sincerely, no doubt, innocent, good in themselves. But the way they act in their social environs is that it's a kind of a wrong goodness. They are absolutely sincerely good, but they cause catastrophe all around. You know, and for example, Prince Mishke, what does he cause? Nastasia Filipovna gets murdered by that other guy, whatever. He causes catastrophe around himself. Okay, the same Rowan Williams provided a wonderful definition in his book on Dostoevsky on what really is the divine dimension at its most elementary. And he, Rowan Williams, makes a reference to four British Catholic novelists, O'Connor, Percy, Spark, and Ellis, and this is what he says about them, a short quote. All four create a world in which the secular majority account of what is going on is relativized. But there is no simple alternative that anyone can step into by a single decision or even a series of decisions in the sense of this secular reality is shitty and there must be a higher order. The religious dimension of these fictions lies in the insistent sense of incongruity, unmistakable even if no one within the fiction can say what we should be congruent with. So it's just that our world is out of join inconsistent, lacking something, but it's literally negative theology. Not negative theology in the usual sense. God is so much beyond that we cannot uh, uh, describe it properly. No, it's simply God is just this absence. The empty place comes before what we fill it in through our images of God. The basic divine dimension is this void. Just this void. In the sense of our reality is not con something is terribly wrong with this reality. And I think not only we can think with, we can think this in a materialist way, but the only proper way is to think it in a materialist way. And here things get complicated. Here we should reject, you know, one of the most famous formula of Marx, that religion is the opium of the people. First, be careful, Marx does not say for the people. This would be way too vulgar for Marx. It's not that, as in a certain naive form of enlightenment, some evil priests are fabricating religion the way drug dealers like from Colombia, <laughs> sorry, my bad, <laughs> I'm so sorry, are fabricating, no, it's of the people. But you know what's my, my main argument against this formula today? Yes, we have a religion which works as the opium of the people. Of course, the terrorist, fundamentalist religion, but never forget, not just in Muslim countries. I'm here a radical pessimist. You know that FBI has under observation in the United States two million Christian fundamentalists suspected of being potentially terrorists. I'm sorry to tell you, that's basically the same percentage as among Arabs, you know. So the question should not be just to be Islamophobic, it should be what is it in the dialectic of modern global capitalism that pushes people towards fundamentalism. But okay, this is, or this is kind of also maybe a version today of the opium, uh, religion as the opium of the people. But there are at least two others, and I think Adorno already says this somewhere. We have two other opiums of the people. You will guess, I hope, which are they. Opium and people. For <laughs> populists, their opium is people themselves. You know this, 
fantasmatic image people and so on. Le, Marine Le Pen's opium are the people and so on, no? The true French people threatened by... And the other uh, opium of the people is opium. For many intellectuals, opium is drugs. It's opium itself, you know. <laughs> so the way to get out of it, I am for a religious dimension, but in this purely abstract way, and I don't have time to do it, a wonderful reading can be given in this sense to link since These guys are Danish people to link with the obvious person, with Kierkegaard, no? whose formulas of religion, when he says God is not something we relate to, God is relating itself. And all those formulas, who at least I think, come to the edge of a certain type of very paradoxical materialism. I don't want to bore you too much, and I hope you will not protest again against this politically correct madness I've shown you too much. My God, if you... I, I, you know, also when I talk about rapes, people claim you shouldn't talk in such uh, plastic terms or whatever, you know, that it's shocking. Fuck you, it should be shocking, you know, because if you just abstractly describe it, then it doesn't really affect you. Then it's just, oh, it's like bureaucratic statistics, you know. No, you should be shocked by the horrors which go on. Thanks very much for your kind patience.